Hello everyone and welcome to Couples and Sticks with Stephanie Palin. Steph, a warm welcome back to online events. Thank you, John. It seems ages since we last worked together and I'm really delighted to be here today. Well, it's great to have you back. It does feel like a long time because we've done, well, we did the Octia conferences together, didn't we? We've done some interviews and... And then I think it was your addiction conference in Edinburgh. That's the, right, that's right. I saw yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's great to have you back for this, Steph. And to start off our Working With Couples mm. 2016 conference. Um, yeah, and to get straight to what can be hard about being in relationship, I guess, the, the most intimate parts yeah. of our relationships. It's great to be able to have a conversation about that, do some thinking really yeah. benefit from your experience, Steph, yeah. Thanks, John, yeah. But before we get into all that, we usually do a bit of, oh, I'm forgetting all about the people who are online with us, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> what am I like? Why don't we say hi to everyone who is joining us live on the site? Yeah. 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 Hello, everyone. I'm really pleased to be able to speak to you today. Um, I guess some of you will um, be familiar with my work and others of you won't. But I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you today about um, some of the ways that I work. Um, yeah, great, Steph. No, that's fab. It's, and I can see Saz is in the chat room taking care of everyone. So if anybody's trying to get in to say hello yeah. um, and is struggling, send Sandra a message. Mm -hmm. She'll help you out. I've got my eye in the chat room. So, Steph, you're up for questions and comments. Oh, yeah. I am. Yeah, I'm. I can't actually see the chat room at the moment. I decided to focus on watching you, John. Oh, great. <laughs> I hope that's a good decision. <laughs> and hi, yeah. Stars. You're doing a great job. <laughs> yeah, taking care of us all. Fantastic. Yeah. And, of course, if you're catching this up in the library or you're here today and to listen and not be in the chat room, that's great too. Steph and I are really pleased to have your attention yeah. and to have you with us. Yeah. So, uh, Steph, I guess we get to join you in your counselling room. I was just, it looks like it's such a lovely space. Yeah. That's right, it is. Yes, this is where I see my face to face clients. And in fact, it's also where I, um, I usually sit to, when I'm working with people online or by webcam, uh, because increasingly, um, you know, there's a, a, a number of clients who like to use webcam rather than have to travel. Mm -hmm. uh, or indeed who are in other parts of the world so you know can't travel to sit with me here yeah so it gives yeah. you and your clients that flexibility if people can't be there in yeah. your counseling room um, yeah that's right and it's lovely for us to get a chance to to be in that space mm -hmm. with you for a while today and can you give us a sense of where in the world you are Steph physically could that be okay yeah, physically I, I live um Midway between Manchester and Liverpool, uh, really close to both the M6 and the M62. So it's an ideal spot when I'm doing training work because I can get north, south, east, west. I'm also on a main train line. So, um, you know, it takes me three hours to get to Edinburgh, two hours to get to London. So uh, really well placed to, to move around. And of course, increasingly, I am doing um, training work. Well, I say increasingly, I've done a lot of training work, but with um, the ending of the Relate Institute that I've worked for for 25 years, um, then my own therapy institute is really coming to the fore in terms of the training work I'm doing there. Yeah, yeah well, it's great to get a sense of that, like kind of what sits alongside your private practice. And of yeah. course, in your institute, you have a course, I guess, uh, Oh, well, like, yes, a couple of courses. Couple, there's, yeah. there's an online course for counsellors who um, want to learn to work online. Um, but the most successful one recently that I've got going is, is the Diploma in Sex Addiction, working with individuals and with couples on recovery from sex addiction uh, and training therapists to do that, which is, I love working with experienced therapists. Um, yeah. And, and that's the work. And, and I'll shortly be starting a, a diploma in sex therapy as well. Fantastic. So it's worth people checking out your website. It is. Yes. It's therapyinstitute.co.uk. Easy to remember. Fantastic. Stuff. And we will have that in the resource guide for the event as well. So 
yeah. colleagues can click through, catch up with what you're doing. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And of, of course, for this hour, um, you're saying to us that you would spend some time thinking about what happens when one or more in a couple have gone off sex, if you yes. like. Yeah, yeah. And what, what do you mean by that, Steph? Like, kind of gone off? Yeah. Well, that's often what, you know, when, when couples or individuals come for therapy, um, and I say, and, you know, how is what's going on in your life affecting your intimate life, your sex life? And they'll go, oh, I'm off that. <laughs> Okay. Or we haven't made love for three months, six months, six years, mm. even. Mm. Um, you know, so it, it it can be a problem. If both partners are happy not to be sexually intimate together, then it, it's not a problem. Mm. But more often than not, it's when one partner wants to be sexual and the other doesn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And... Is like that might be a question you would ask a couple, even if they're not coming to you explicitly, to work with their sex life. Is that... I, w I would indeed, yes, yeah. because sex is a subject that's really difficult to talk about. I know that of the huge number of counselling courses that there are, very few of them actually do anything specific about sexual relationships. Mm. Also, and even fewer do anything about sexual problems. And I don't mean turning people into sex therapists, because no. that's a much more specific area. But actually, people sometimes just welcome the chance to say, do you know, that's a real problem for me. Yeah. But they don't like to bring it up. You know, it's yeah. difficult yeah. to say. And that's, that's a fascinating dilemma if the therapist is thinking, well, I'll wait for the client. The client's thinking, well, unless the therapist asks. And yes. And, Steph, in one of your presentations when we worked together, you told a great story, and I always tell my students this story, which is like you were working with a couple and um, you said to them, well, what did your last therapist do with you around your relationship, your sexual relationship? And the, the couple said to you, oh, every time we brought it up, the therapist changed the subject, <laughs> which is how I remember the story. Maybe it's not Absolutely, quite... yeah. Yes. yeah. But like, like for us also to watch that in ourselves, like, he, like maybe the client does want to, and maybe is giving us those signals, and can we be open to that? And yeah, yeah. And, and quite often clients have gone, for example, to see their doctor, wanting to bring up the subject of I've got a sexual problem, but actually the doctor not hearing either, no. because they're unsure then what to do about it. Yeah, you know, and, and maybe very uncomfortable talking about sexual matters, and and that's surprising. We assume doctors are going to be okay with that, but they're just human beings, and they've got their own uh, awkward moments and, and awkward subjects to talk about. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And I think there's something about our culture here in the UK where we get easily embarrassed. Yes, I guess, or like there's something in our culture that might also be in us. Yeah. as practitioners or our client might kind of try and ask but it comes out all back to front we're not quite sure what they're asking us and it could get lost that way too yeah. Or... Yeah. but one of the first things about um you know either being able to deal with sexual problems or even just to talk about it with clients because often that in itself helps is giving clients permission to talk about it you know, by asking them about their sexual relationship, you're actually saying this is an okay subject to talk about. Yeah. Even though it's maybe a very private one, it may... And from the therapist's point of view, I think often there's that sense of, am I being too intrusive? Is this too private an area to talk about? But actually, it's often a big relief to the client to be able to say what's going on in their sex lives. Mm. Mm, for sure. Yeah. I know that for me, like those kind of things, that kind of cultural embarrassment and the, am I pushing too hard? I often have to take a deep breath and think, right, yeah, here go. we go and let's do, yeah. but let's try and do this in a kind of a helpful way. And I, I wonder if that's also true for any of the colleagues that are joining us live I, on the site. Like, what is it like to ask that question? Or do we find ourselves not? Or. Mm. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, what I know is, of course, is that um, the most common sexual problem that couples face is loss of desire or inhibition of sexual desire. And it's also, that's the problem that is mostly tied up either with something else that's going on in the rest of their life or something that's going on in their relationship. And so doing the work with the relationship may free them up to think about why they're not being sexual together. So it is something that counsellors and therapists can tackle. I'm not saying that they would then um, do the bit about getting them going again sexually, because that really is the specialist sex therapist, but actually talking about what's going on in your life um, that's caused you to lose interest in sex. Yeah, so that's the bit that we work well with, like the relationship, the this maybe like the stress that someone might have at their work, or yeah. like other, maybe yes. someone's getting bullied somewhere, or like there could be, yeah, like, yeah. I mean, not lots of reasons. Just for example, having a young family, right? You know, yeah. disturbed sleep, not feeling your best, yeah. um, can just think, oh, I really can't be bothered with that, that side of life. Yeah. And, but actually, you know, people tend to make an assumption that it's, oh, we've been together 20 years, we've been together 30 years. It's bound to change. Well, yes, it's bound to change, but actually neither age nor boredom is the underlying cause because newlyweds, people in a new relationship, can go off sex. There are lots of reasons why the sexual relationship doesn't doesn't work, and of course, in um, although we assume there is so much information about sex in our society, so many sexual images and so on, and yet, if people have got a problem with sex, the last thing they want to read about is sex. So it sort of becomes a vicious circle. They'll see an article in a magazine, and then they'll go, "I don't really want to read that." Or if my partner s sees me reading that, that might start a conversation that I'm really too uncomfortable to have with them. Uh, and so, although you can assume that the information is out there, you can't assume that people have read it. Mm. And, and I don't find these days that clients are much better informed about sexual functioning and their sex lives than they were 20 years ago. The, the only difference is that they, they may well get some very unrealistic expectations from watching pornography. <laughs> and I know that um, the, someone's going to be talking about sex and porn addiction later. Mm -hmm. But that is very much one of the factors and one of the areas that I will ask couples about. Because um, watching videos in particular of sexual activities can mean that the partner who's doing that really goes off sex with a partner because it's not as exciting, it doesn't give their brain the same stimulation, or it's harder work because you've got to get a partner aroused. Right, yeah. Whereas you're watching something on the internet, you don't. Yeah, so yeah. it's much easier, much less work. And, I mean, that could be something counterintuitive for us as therapists. We might think if someone is watching porn, yeah. then they're likely to be more sexually active, but it could be the other way around, actually, or with their partner, anyway. Yeah, that's yeah. right. They may be sexual active themselves watching the pornography, mm -hmm. but actually not with the partner. Yeah. 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 And I mean, one, one of the um, sexual difficulties that happens when people watch a lot of porn is that they, um, the ma uh, male may have erectile problems so that they don't have a problem with the pornography, but actually when it comes to a real partner, um, they have difficulties. They struggle to get erections or they struggle to maintain them. Um, but actually, if they stop watching the pornography for a period of time, then they recover. Right. Wow. Wow. So something about having some abstinence around the pornography can yeah. help the, the actual physical function. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah.
And do you know why that is, Steph? Is, it'd be interesting to make that link, or yeah. or is that a, is that a longer story than we have it time is for? It's a longer story. Right, okay. I, I guess Paula might have something to say about that right. later on. So you know, I, I won't I won't get into yeah. that. But it is really really interesting yeah. um, to to focus on that and to look at people's recovery from it. But you but know, that could be something that we could know and say to our clients, like we have. We do know something about this, and maybe if it's hard to stop, then yes. then maybe that's the kind of stuff we'll be talking with with Paula. Yeah, yes. yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Steph. And, and it's particularly difficult for men to own that they are off, they've gone off sex, or that they're not interested anymore, because you know the myths are that men are always interested in sex. They're thinking about it every minute. They're always up for it. You know, and, and actually for a man to say, well, do you know what? I'm really not that bothered. Mm. Uh, it's quite quite difficult. Yeah. And, and often in therapy, it's the, the female partner who drags them along saying, what's going on? He doesn't fancy me anymore. There's some, something going on. Mm. Um, and it, it may be that he's very stressed at work. It may be that um, there's resentment going on. I mean, I had a client some time ago who um, had, he had just taken on a very stressful job um, mm -hmm. as a, a senior manager that involved him working away from home quite a lot. And at the same time, his wife said, oh, well, now that you're earning a lot more money, um, I'll go part time. Mm. And so his resentment... And have him having to work longer hours, be away from home, and she suddenly was just working mornings. Right. Yeah. So and a real impact. Yeah. Yeah. So when it came to being intimate, he just. Yeah. Yeah, the resentment was getting in the way. Yeah. Yes, totally. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and that often happens. And what couples tend to do is that uh, then they'll start um, developing what you know, you call safety behaviours, that stops them talking about it and stops it becoming an issue. So that might be uh, going to bed at different times. Mm. Oh, you go to bed, I'll just finish watching this film. Um, or, oh, if you're watching the football, I'm going to go up to bed early. Mm. And so by the time the other partner comes to bed, the first one's either asleep or feigning sleep. Mm. So there, there's no opportunity at that time for them to be intimate together um, and uh, avoiding talking about the problem you know by never bringing up the area and, and what again what tends to happen is that over a period of about say six months um, the any physical affection tends to stop because the partner who doesn't want to be sexual thinks well if we have a cuddle they'll think it's an invitation to sex mm. And so the longer it goes on, the more likely the couple is to lose all physical contact and all physical affection. Uh, and, and that can be very distressing for both partners. Yeah, like because you know, any kind of re-engagement of like a cuddle or something might, after a long time, feel like a real invitation and the partner doesn't want Oh, yeah, right. that can it's get just, really... Yeah. It's just a cuddle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that, like the no physical contact in the relationship can, that could be a real chasm between yes. people in a relationship. Yes, yeah. it can. Yeah. And, and part, of, part of the counselling would be about helping them to just re-engage, you know, even if it's just um, a hug and a peck on the cheek as they say hello and goodbye, even if it's just uh, holding, hold, if it's holding hands when they go out. If it's just those, those sort of minimal contacts are a start, getting them moving in the right direction. I, and like, would you be contracting then that it's really clear that it, this is not going to turn into sex? It's like really important, have the minimal contact and just know that that's what it is. It's yeah. part of starting over or something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that they both agree, you know, that uh, yeah. they, can even, they can even have a date night together. Um, and I, I know people go, oh, date nights. But <laughs> you know, when, when a relationship's new and fresh, um, you make an effort when you're going to meet your new partner. Yeah. 
you put something nice on to wear, you make sure you've had a bath, you put your makeup on. Well, I don't suppose you put your makeup on, John. <laughs> Can you not see my... <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yes, you do. Don't you make sure you're looking your best, you're smelling your best, all those things. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so on a date night, that's what I invite the couple to do. Mm. You know, make, make it a special evening that you're going out. If you, if you just go down to your local pub, just the two of you, and have a couple of drinks, or you go, you know, you go to the cinema together. Whatever you do, make it a special evening. Mm. And then agree whether you want it to go further, whether you just want to see what happens, or whether you want it just to be a date night that is a time to be together. Right, yeah. So, so almost, agree. well, let's agree that before we start. Yes. Like, what, like what, what we're both thinking about. Yeah. And of course, dressing up a bit is, is a signalling to each other, well, you're worth this effort. You're, yes. And vice versa is kind of also signalling something else, isn't it? If I just go to the movies in all my work clothes and I don't yeah. make effort, then... Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And I mean, I, I guess um, Barry McCarthy, who with his wife runs um, a low sex and no sex clinics in America and, and does quite a bit of research. I mean, he says that about 20% of married couples are in a no sex marriage. And that means they have sex 10 times a year or less. Mm -hmm. And about another 15% have sex 25 times a year or less. You know, so that's once a fortnight to once a month. Um, and that the figure's actually higher in couples who are not married, but who are living together. Um, so one in three people who lived together for two years have a, 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 a no-sex relationship, mm -hmm. which is quite a staggering figure, really. Yeah. Yeah. And that's regardless of age. So it's... Um, well, and that can be counterintuitive too in terms of the messages we get about sex in the media, almost like everybody else is having sex all the time, every night, yeah. and like the stats are not showing that at all. One in three is, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, another thing that he fig figures in is that um, when, when we watch sex, I don't mean pornography, but I mean when sex is shown in a movie or on television, it's always, it's smooth, it's passionate, it's spontaneous, it's always successful, mm -hmm. you know. And so couples can sometimes get really unrealistic expectations mm -hmm. of how their sex life should be. And um, one of the quotes from Barry McCarthy is that if you expect movie sex, you'll end up having no sex because you'll be constantly disappointed <laughs> by the reality of your own experience. Yeah. And I think, you know, that, that's a good thing, you know, to say to people, lower your expectations. Go for good enough sex. It doesn't have to be movie quality. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, quite I think that's a, a really handy thing to, if we want movie sex, we'll end up with no sex. Yeah, that's a really nice thing to, an easy thing to communicate to clients as well, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And sometimes you can see the couple sort of look at one another as though, you know, they've had that conversation. Yes, they know exactly what has been talked about, yes. I'm Quite sure we all do. Like yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. And long-lasting sexual desire is based not just on physical attraction and physical closeness, but it's also about emotional closeness. And particularly for women... The, the sense of emotional closeness is very much tied in with their desire for their partner and desire for sex. Mm. Although, I, I, you know, I have to say that men are getting much more clued up and more men are valuing the importance of emotional intimacy as well, mm. um, which, you know, is important to acknowledge. But it, but it is, you know, maintaining a good sex life takes commitment, it takes time and and couples always have to make an effort you know for one another if the sex life is going to be successful that makes sense it's not just like how we kind of maybe take care of our bodies have a bath and put on some nice clothes but are we paying attention to each other emotionally too yeah. as well just yes. yeah. do we notice what's going on yeah 
you know, if a partner's really stressed and having a difficult time, do we do we notice that and want to do something caring for them? Mm. Or find out if there's any way we can help? Or do we just ignore it? Yeah. Right, right. Mm. Well, there's a question just come in a few minutes ago in the chat room, and I wonder if this is a, mm. a good place for it. And if it's not, we can come back to yeah. it. Um, but whether, Steph, you have any thoughts about couples where there is an attachment issue with one of the partners yeah. and their sex life is affected. Um, I mean, I guess that could be lots of things, but do you think about attachment when you're thinking about couples? And Oh, absolutely all the time. All I mean, time, I think yeah. in terms of the couple dynamics, attachment is the theory that I will go to. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I think what is the main issue is that um, a good sex life, a good close emotional relationship is about trust. And if somebody has an insecure attachment early in their lives, what they haven't learned is to trust people. Trust people that you can be intimate, you can be close, you can share your vulnerabilities, you can share your weaknesses with that person and trust that they won't betray you. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and somebody, uh, I think, with attachment issues has often never learned that trust because they felt betrayed, let down, disappointed in the people that they were close to in their early life. Um, so it makes sense that it, that would have an impact on the relationship, the sexual relationship, to have yeah. that trust... Yeah. yeah. I mean, our first intimate relationship is with the person who brings us up from childhood. Yeah. Um, yeah. And our second, and that forms a model for our second intimate relationship, which is with another adult. You know, and so the the pattern will reflect um, the difficulties or the successes that we had as children. Yeah. If someone who's securely attached is much more likely to be able to go into a sexual relationship and let themselves go and abandon themselves to the pleasures of that and feel close and intimate. Um, whereas somebody who doesn't trust the world and doesn't trust people will be very hesitant about doing that. And that will be reflected in their sex life. It, it may be reflected in that they don't have a fulfilling um really deep sexual relationship. They might have lots of one night stands, for example. Mm. So that they have so they might be very active. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But not very, maybe not very fulfilling. Mm. The physical side, the need for orgasm might be met, mm. but actually not the need for closeness. Right. And I guess that could spill into I mean we'll do more of this later, but around addiction too, about being soothed in the pleasure, I guess, and yeah. then not uh, kind of almost feeling abandoned in the lack of contact. And, yes. Yeah, that's powerful yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yes, and, and people who, who feel that they are... Sometimes a, a, a partner will say, Do you know, I just feel as though they're going through the motions of sex. They're doing it for me, but actually I don't feel close. Mm. I feel very lonely when we have that sort of sex. Mm. But when both partners are involved, they both want to please one another, and they're both taking pleasure for themselves, it feels very close, very intimate. And your brain floods with the hormone oxytocin, yeah. which is, you know, it's the hormone that bonds mother and baby. But it's also produced in quite high levels after orgasm. Quite a lot. It, it's produced if you have an orgasm on your own through masturbation, but it's produced at a much, much higher level when a couple are close and they have loving sex together. Yeah. So, and so that's a moment of real bonding then, like yeah. when we think about the chemicals too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. The, 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 the time after sex, when couples often do feel very close to one another, is the time when your brain is flooded with the oxytocin. And you just feel, you know, the world's a good place to be. Mm. If the sex has been good and close and satisfying. Yeah. You know, so the, the, the anticipation and the desire and what happens after sex are actually the two bits that make a sex life satisfying. Ah, interesting. Right. So there can be so much focus on actually 
orgasm. The, the <laughs> orgasm, yeah, <laughs> on the orgasm, absolutely, <laughs> on that physical moment. And but in terms of how we're wired, it's the before and after, right? It is, yeah. And I mean, the, the average length of uh, of a sexual encounter, if you're actually looking at sexual intercourse, is about three and a half to four minutes. Mm. It's not a long time yeah. in a couple's life, is it? But the build-up might be a lot longer, and the afterglow might last a lot longer. Yeah. Um, so, so that's why the, you know, the beginning and the end are really important. And they're things I will always ask couples about. Mm. How, how, do you, how do you prepare for sex? How do you know? Because lots of clients say, I want it to be really spontaneous. Yeah. I don't like planning things, but do you know what? Sex is rarely spontaneous, mm. is it? You know, when, think of a new relationship. You would, before you go out with your partner, you'd have a bath or a shower. You'd, you know, if you're a man, you'll have a shave because you don't want to be stubbly when you're yeah. getting close to a partner. Women will often, you know, make sure that, that they are nice to know. They'll have a shower. They might, you know, they'll put the makeup on, nice clothes. And you're planning yeah. for the end of the night as well, aren't you? So well ahead of those three or four minutes. <laughs> well ahead, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So sex is, is not that spontaneous, you know. And some couples find that planning uh, for sex, particularly if you've got young children, you have to, mm -hmm. um, Planning when they will have some couple time together actually gives them the chance to anticipate how things are going to be mm. and to, to, to plan. And, and sometimes I'll say to couples who are, you know, really trying to get their sex lives going again, you know, put an alarm on your phone and every hour on the hour, just think for a few seconds about what it's going to be like mm -hmm. when you get together tonight. That, that's called simmering. Ah, it puts yeah. the thought into your head yes. and it keeps it going you know and, and sometimes couples will text one another during the day and say really looking forward to tonight mm. other couples hate that right for some people that's not the right thing but yeah. for some couples that might help them do the simmering and just yeah. the yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And, and and it also gives a message that i might be at work i might not be with you but i'm just thinking about you yeah yeah and that's, that, again, that's really important, isn't it, mm. to know that mm. your partner has thoughts of you, yeah. even if they just send on a, just a short text. Yeah, like it's part of that emotional connection. Yes, yeah. 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 I, I'm thinking about the, maybe one or both in a couple has those attachment things going on, maybe the, like a difficult separation, and... Is, is there anything you might be doing with that couple to help them with the trust? Or Well, you... yeah, I mean, I, I'd probably be doing some background work on their attachment issues. Right, okay, that um, would make sense. Yeah, yeah just, yeah. just to, you know, the, the counselling, the talking therapies. Um, but, but again, introducing them slowly to that, you know, friendly contact, the, um, the hand-holding, the hello, goodbye, kiss a cuddle on the sofa, sitting together in the evening if they're just watching television, discovering, for example, you know, one, one partner might like their feet to be massaged, mm. uh, getting them, for example, to just do a hand massage to one another, surprising how intimate that can feel, mm. or um, a head and shoulders massage, nothing sexual, but actually they are beginning to make contact with one another and they're beginning to trust that we're, this is all we're going to do, but it feels good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that sounds like some lovely kind of little things we could encourage clients to be doing. And we've got another couple of questions coming in, hey. Steph, if, if that's okay. Um, like, so we're t I guess we're talking about seeing both um, partners in a couple relationship yeah. together. Would you ever see the partner separately, or would you always want to work with them together? Or? No, um, I I will generally towards the beginning of therapy. I if I, I will see each partner on their own, hmm. just to see if there is a story that can't be told in front of the partner. Mm -hmm. um, and it might be I I really 
don't fancy my partner just at the moment. I don't find them physically attractive. It might be that the partner's put on a lot of weight. It might be that they've lost a lot of weight. Mm. It might be something they're doing or not doing mm. that is a real turn-off. Yeah. Um, and being on their own gives them a chance to say that to me. And then I'll, I'll usually say, is that something that we can talk about when you're together? Because it gives you an opportunity to change that. Mm. Or, you know, I'll say at the end of that session, is there something we've talked about together today that you really don't want your partner to know? Right. So it's really important that, that mm. you would hold on to that and not share something that well, wasn't okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it depends what it is. If they suddenly tell me that they are having a rampant affair and mm. that, you know, they're really, their heart isn't in the couple relationship because they've got a partner elsewhere, then um, that really would jeopardise their chances of working together as a couple. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It does. So there might be something that, that comes up like that. And it sounds like, though, in, in those early sessions where you're seeing the couple separately, you're really going after that. What, like, what is it would be hard to say when you're both together? What, yes. Where's that? Yep. Yeah. And, and it might be that there's some form of domestic abuse as well. You know, if one partner is very controlling. Right, yes. Um, and it's difficult to say that in front of their partner. Mm -hmm. And then you, you might want to consider whether couple therapy is right for them anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but on, on the other hand, um, if there's something revealed like childhood sexual abuse that is interfering with their couple sex life, again, I might see that partner... Uh, to do some individual therapy about the, 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 the childhood abuse, just to see whether that, you know, is something that they need to work on. Well, it will be something they need to work on. So the uh, couple could work together, but you could see one of the couple on their own yes. to kind of for that extra support and work. And, and, and I tend to um, sort of build that in so that I might see the one partner on their own for three sessions, and then the fourth session, I'll see them as a couple and look at, you know, how's this impacting on you as a couple? How are you managing it? Hmm. You know, has it made any difference? Oh, that makes and sense. I, yes. I remember having, yeah, I remember having a patient when I worked in the health service who said, she said, it's really nice. Did I know my partner's supporting me? Because when I've had a session with you, um, when I get home, he's almost standing at the door with a cup of coffee and a cigarette for me. <laughs> Oh, that is lovely, isn't it? Yeah. And, yeah. and he knows that I then, I'll, I'll go up to the bedroom and I'll just think about stuff. Mm. And he doesn't inquire, but says, do you want to talk? If I say yes, he'll listen. If I say no, he doesn't push. You know, so even if a partner's not in that session, he was really showing massive support mm. and connection mm. uh, and understanding of what, you know, even though we didn't want to know the details of what was being talked about. Yeah, and I guess if both partners and a couple have met you, they've done a little bit of work with you, then that can take out that sometimes a partner can feel a bit threatened if, some, if one is going for therapy and the other one's like, I'm not sure what's going on, but they both know you, they know how you are. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's particularly important if I'm seeing a male client. Mm. You know, if I'm seeing a male pl client with a sexual problem and doing some sex therapy with him and he says, my partner doesn't particularly want to be involved, I think it's quite important that I meet the partner at least once to say, you know, how are things for you and, and this is the work we might be doing so that they trust. Right, yeah, because I guess maybe the trust is at an all-time low, perhaps. Yeah. If, yeah, depending on the kind of work. So, yeah, that makes sense. And and we're getting a little bit more feedback on this question, which okay. is really helpful. Just saying some feedback for you, Steph, this is really interesting and helpful. And an anxiety that maybe when we see um, couples, the partner separately, we could get drawn into a game or something. Are, are you watching out for that too? That, I guess we, like all couples, have our dramas, don't we? we yes. Like, how, how do you manage that in the work? Yeah. Well, I will, I'll, I'll often say to the couple that, when I see them as a couple, mm. that uh, I want to offer you individual sessions, but we will discuss in that session um, what you don't want your partner to know and what we will 
feel free to bring back when I see you as a couple again. Mm. Um, and if I, if I do think that there's a sort of bit of game playing going on, I will address that with the person in the room and look at, is this, go, is this something we're going to talk about when you come back together so I can get your partner's perspective on it? Um, and, and I think if you've got quite a robust therapeutic relationship, because mm. that's so important with whatever client you're working with, they've got to trust us as therapists, don't they? Yeah. To be working in their best interests. Absolutely. And like in that strong alliance, we can push hard, I guess. Like if we feel like there's something going on here, some game playing that, that we're not, well, it doesn't sound like you're kind of tiptoeing around that stuff. You're, no. <laughs> That doesn't sound like you at all, Steph. But but important that we have that really direct con contact. Yeah. 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 And you know, I, I feel okay with most of my clients with saying things like, you know, now I'm really wanting to help you to overcome this problem, but it feels as though there's something going on that isn't being spoken about between the two of you. Mm. And I wonder if you, you know, can talk about what that might be. And really try and bring it out into the open. Well, that feels like a really clear and direct statement that you're, uh, but you're not blaming someone or telling them they're not okay. But it's like, right, let's get into this. And yes. yeah, because we all have that. We've all grown up with some game. Well, most of us, haven't we? And we it kind of plays out in our relationships. And I guess for the therapist to catch it for us and just be yeah. really clear about it. Yeah. yeah. And, and to, to, to be able to use immediacy to challenge that behaviour. Mm -hmm. um, really yeah. difficult. And, and, and sometimes I will have a, a client who, um, you know, we explore the problem and I can see from the dynamics, for example, I mean, one of the issues that, that's quite common is that one partner has a higher sex drive than the other. Um, and so the one who's got the lower sex drive sees that their partner is always, always asking for sex. Mm. And it might be that the, the one with the higher sex drive might want to have sex a couple of times in the week, but they ask every day. Oh, okay. And so it seems that, mm. you know, the partner with the lower sex drive thinks he or she is sex mad and I don't want it every day. But they get into this sort of standoff. Mm. rather than exploring it they they sort of and, and that can be very difficult yeah to work with those those different levels and, and actually when it comes down to one of the questions i'll ask when they're separate is how often would you like to make love and the vast majority of people will say i'd be happy if it was a couple of times a week mm. Mm. even though their partner's perception is but you want it every day you see what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Like just to be able to have that conversation and say, right, what is it you want? And and to clear up those misperceptions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and when the partner with the lower sex drive thinks, Oh gosh, well if I say yes, he's going to want it every day or she's going to want it every day, then to actually have the clear conversation that says, Do you know what? We'd both be happy with it twice a week. What are we going on about? You know, why have we got into this game? Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, and yeah, th then suddenly it settles and yeah, it's manageable, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And it might be that for, for a while they timetable it, and, and that's in sex therapy is what we would do. We would say, I want you to plan three hours in the week when you can do something physical together, um, and let's get this habit established. Most couples actually settle down eventually to twice a week. We say do it three times, but they settle into twice a week. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're both aiming for. By the time you've finished therapy, you've established a habit, which is twice a week, we make time for one another. Mm -hmm. When we make time, we can, we can be close and have a cuddle, or we can be sexual together. And we can be as sexual as we like. There's lots of things that couples do. I mean, we tend to get a bit hung up on sex equals sexual intercourse. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. But sex equals a lot more. You know, a couple could dance together and it'd be very sexual. Yeah. 
um, they they could um, you know just cuddle up together in bed and actually it feel very Im intimate and very sexual. And so whatever activities they have, as long as it makes them feel closer and it's something they both want, that will help them to feel feel better. Yeah. 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 And it makes so much time having that as a habit. Yeah. Like like whatever it is, but it, because it's it's so easy to be overrun by life, I guess, and then our habits are kind of dictated by external forces, but I guess for the couple to say, right, this is what we do, and yeah. And, and it, I mean, it's interesting when, um, you know, if I say to a couple, right, I want you to set, away, set aside three separate hours before you see me again next week, um, just to do something that involves you touching one another in a sensual, non-sexual way, and they go, oh yeah, that'll be easy. And then they come back and go, okay, so have you done the three sessions? And they go, Yes, um, okay. we just, one two nights ago we did one last night and we've just done one before we came to see you. <laughs> and so that they've done all of their homework, okay. Yes. yes. But, you know, yeah. time has run away with them in the week. Yeah, yeah. So that um, it's been very much last minute. And if that just raises their awareness of the fact that we're not prior prioritising time as a couple. Yeah. Yeah. And the next week, they are more likely to be able to spread it out. Or, or, indeed, a lot of couples will say, well, really, do you know what? Long hours in the week, children in the week, homework. Uh, it will have to be weekend. Mm. Okay, so it could be Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It could be Friday, Saturday afternoon, mm -hmm. Sunday. Mm -hmm. you know, who's to say it has to be in bed at night? Yeah. So just to think about other possibilities to our routine and how we schedule and yeah, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But re restoring the affectionate touching is always the bit that I would start with, you know, so not being sexual. Because often people are quite embarrassed and self um, self conscious about becoming sexual again. But actually just doing the hand holding and the, and the, the affectionate touching is an easier place to start. Yeah, that that feels like great advice. And what you said earlier about like just maybe a little hand massage yeah. that, that might feel really affectionate, but actually could start just quite easily and yeah. that's something that a couple yeah. would feel like they could manage. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. when when a relationship's new, we have lots of turn on messages. Right, yes. You've got lots of projections. Your new partner is the most wonderful thing you've ever set eyes on. Yeah. Um, so you have lots of turn on messages. Yeah. And most people will say that that's when their sex life is at its most frequent. Um, but as we get to know that person in all their vulnerabilities and weaknesses and strengths, we also find out some of the things that turn us off. And so it's always it's useful. I, I will get clients to write down what their turn off messages are oh, that they've okay. developed, and some of them will be from the family. Mm. Don't be sexual. Mm -hmm. oh, nice girls don't. Yes, yes. <laughs> particularly. Um, but to write those down and, and look at you know how unhelpful these messages are, yeah. and then also to think about what turn off messages you have as a couple. That might be that we can't talk about sex, or I don't feel that I can ask for what I want sexually, or tell my partner that something they're doing is something I don't like. Mm. And so helping them to have those conversations as a couple, um, it's about communication, and I know you've got a session later on about communication. Yes, yes. It's always so important. Mm. Sexual communication is that bit harder, mm. you know, than than the everyday communication. Yeah. But we could have all those messages and assumptions and just not know them, I got, or they're not explicit, I guess, to yes. us. And, yeah. Yes. Some of those messages are so implicit mm -hmm. and, and have you know, come from such an early time in life that we don't question them. We might not even be wholly conscious of them. So focusing on what thoughts do I have, what messages do I have, what negative thoughts do I have when I think about being sexual? Yeah can really help people. Yeah. Yeah. 
Steph, we've got a little over five minutes left. The time is just crashing by. I just, I've just picked up the time there. Um, I well, I know there there was another question in the chat room that I've kind of been holding and also wondering whether there's anything you because it, it feels like we're just scratching the surface here. Of course Absolutely. we are. Yeah, yeah. Whether well, there might be anything you want to leave us with to think about. Um, th would that be okay just to take this question and then... Yes, of course. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, it feels hard to interrupt when there's so much to talk about. <laughs> but it's, it's So, like, clients can come to therapy with body image issues. Yes. Yeah, well, that sounds like something that you've... <laughs> you've seen and think about too yeah. and it could be a real challenge I guess to be that intimate when yes yeah. yes it can and again one one of the um, interventions that I will use is that I've got um, lots of pictures of naked bodies mm. which can form the basis of a discussion um, about you know when you look at these pictures what, what do you think they're not all beautiful slim wonderful proportion people they are just regular human beings in all their shapes and sizes yes. um what you know what, what what does that person think about when they look at that and what, how do they see themselves and where do, where do the mess again where do the messages come from how how can they help so sometimes people you know do have um a, a bdd a body dysmorphia disorder Mm -hmm. where they really focus on one part of their body as being really hideous. Um, and working with that, you know, that pr can provoke huge amounts of anxiety in an individual. Um, and, and again, needs some really careful cognitive work to help them to overcome that and some um, distraction techniques and cognitive behavioral therapy that will help them to realise that um, you know that they are, they are who they are, and part of the self-focus work that I would do is to try to get people just to accept themselves as they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That we we can live with ourselves as kind of normal human beings, and yeah. we've not been airbrushed for a poster or a TV or something. We're just here we are and yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. So, I mean I, I was talking to somebody who used to be a fashion photographer about the extent of the airbrushing that happens um, in you know fashion work these days which just gives people really unrealistic ideas and a friend of my daughter who was on a fashion shoot who works in the fashion industry who took the photographer to task who had two size zero models and someone who was a size six, who he was calling the fat one. Oh my God, wow. Tell the fat one to go to the back. Take the fat one out of the picture. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. Very unrealistic unre ideas. But they, they give kind of some strong, like there are some really strong messages that have got really folded into the culture and, and deep there that yeah, yeah. can have a big impact. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <sighs> there's so much more we there's so say. much but like I, you've been really generous like taking the questions Steph and no. I, I can see you've got some stuff that you did want to bring to us as well I, I, I'm thinking about well it, uh, like the course that you would do if, if colleagues wanted to do more learning um, yeah. I guess what the website is easy to remember. We'll put that in the resource guide. Thank you. So yeah. that, because that's a great, a rich resource if we're working with couples or even individuals to be able just to expand our our yeah. capacity for yeah. this kind of work. Yeah. yeah. And and maybe we can do some more sessions at some stage with some, you know, specific interventions that people can use. You know, very practical ideas of exercises that they can set for people and ways of working. Yeah, that would that's be fantastic, Steph. Yeah, that's good. Well, the prospect of being able to get you back more quickly would be fantastic. That would be... And it would be lovely to be back here yeah, as well. Fantastic. And yeah. as, as a kind of... Well, maybe this is putting you on the spot, but if we find ourselves over the next few weeks we're with a couple yeah. or an individual, we're in that moment thinking, 
Uh, I remember Steph said about, can we ask about yeah. that more intimate part of yeah. someone's relationship? And But we're kind of freaking out a bit, which is not really clinical. Which well, Is there anything that we can do just to help us to, to say, yeah, this is important? Let's... Well, it, it, it's, a, it's a vital part of most people's relationships. Mm. But our culture says we can, t- we can brag about sex. People can talk about wonderful sex. It's very hard to talk about having a sexual problem. And so to find somebody who asks about that, to whom you can say, and clients will often say, I bet I'm the only person who's got this problem. And you, because they feel very isolated, very alone yeah. with whatever's going on. Um, and that might be, you know, that we haven't had sex for a year. Uh, and if it is, for somebody to be able to say, that must be really difficult for you, let's talk about it. It's often, oh, that's yeah. really... So just to imagine that in our clients, the relief that they'll feel that we are open to that, that we can have that conversation. Yes. And, yes. Yeah. And, and even to say it in a sort of fairly gentle way, you know, to say, well, there's a lot going on in your life at the moment. I'm just wondering what impact that's having on your sex life together. Oh, what a nice way to ask, Steph. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think, I think that often allows people to say, well, yeah, you know, it normalises. Yeah, it normalises it. There's actually good reason that things are difficult right now yeah. and and the, the therapist was going to understand it. And yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but, but I, I, I think another thing I would say is that the, the longer you leave it to raise the subject of sex in therapy, the harder it becomes to do that. Right, like two years into a therapeutic relationship is maybe going to be a struggle, I guess, <laughs> yes, yeah. So, like, make sure we're doing it in our assessment process? Yes. Yes, yes. yeah, okay. Yes. That's a great reminder, Steph, yeah. Like, to ha- we'll ask the risk questions, we'll do the boundary thing. Yeah. Are we also asking that question? Yeah. 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 Definitely. That's such a helpful way to to finish, Steph. I really appreciate that. And a lovely way to to give us some vocabulary around how we might ask the question, because sometimes that makes all the difference. Yeah. It does indeed, yeah. So it's it's a less bold question to ask, isn't it? A less mm. shocking one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you to everyone who's been live on the site with us. There's loads of people in the chat room saying thank you, Steph. Oh, giving good. you That's really nice. lovely feedback so thank you everyone Yeah, and Steph we really appreciate being able to get you for an hour on a Monday morning that's been really fantastic we've learned loads and um, we're looking forward to having you back that's going to be great thanks John yeah. and thank you for the opportunity to speak to so many people it's been great thank, oh, thank you, until the next time Steph okay. bye for now bye.